Hi, I'm Michelle Levitt. I'm the Creative and Marketing Director at Heil Sound, and I've worked for the company for about 16 years, and before that, I was a musician. So I've been using uh, microphones for about 25 years now. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen while I'm talking to you guys, or kind of... So I'm also a podcaster. Um, I've worked on every aspect of a podcast from producing to editing and hosting. Uh, I had my own podcast studio and consulting business where we worked on four different shows, including the Heil Sound podcast. 50 Years of Maximum Rock and Roll with Bob Heil is the podcast we did for them that uh, is with our founder, Bob Heil. He's a super interesting guy. He used to be the sound guy for the Grateful Dead and the Who, and he's got some truly amazing stories. Uh, I have helped countless podcasters start their podcasts, and one of the biggest hurdles that all new podcasters faced was the microphone. Understanding the mic, how to sound good, and how to be comfortable behind the mic. My goal today is to give you the tools to approach your mic with confidence. So understanding your sound. We're, today we're going to go over types of microphones, dynamic and condenser, sound treatment, what do you need, element placement, where is the mic element in the body of the microphone, polar patterns and their implications, rear rejection and why it really matters, frequency responses and EQ, gain, spoiler, it's not a volume knob, microphone connections, if that's XLR or USB, and microphone technique, how to get the best sound out of your mic. If you stick around until the very end, I've got some extras for you and a treat. So there's a lot to cover. Let's get started with one of the most frequently asked questions we get at podcast shows. Which type of microphone is right for me? Dynamics or condensers. When deciding on the right microphone for your podcasting needs, there are a lot of things to consider, but one of the first questions you should be asking is should I get a condenser or a dynamic mic? These terms refer to the type of microphone element. The element is the cartridge inside the microphone that picks up sound. You can't generally tell by looking at the outside of a microphone if it is a dynamic or condenser, but they are very different. Dynam dynamic elements are made of a synthetic membrane diaphragm and are connected to a coil of very thin wire that is suspended in a strong magnetic field. As the sound waves hit the diaphragm, the coil of wire vibrates in the magnetic field, causing an electrical signal to be produced. If you've ever taken the cover off of a speaker cabinet, you will see an example of essentially a dynamic microphone, but in reverse. A speaker takes a signal and turns it into audio, whereas a dynamic element takes audio and turns it into a signal. Dynamic microphones are durable, they can handle loud audio sources, and they do not need a power source. More on that in the next slide. And you generally don't need to soundproof a room to use one because they don't pick up as much ambient noise. Applications for dynamic microphones are really just about anywhere. Um, they're kind of a jack of all trades, and they are typically the choice for professional broadcast studios. Condenser microphones, on the other hand, have an element that is made up of a thin film coated with a conductive metallic material, which is suspended over a polarized powered backplate. This condenser diaphragm is part of an electrical circuit that changes voltage with movement, and this voltage becomes the output of the microphone. A condenser plate is a flat surface, and it's really designed to pick up everything in a very detailed way. Applications are anywhere you need highly detailed sound and have a soundproof space. A soundproof space is critical to achieving good, clean audio with a condenser. Condensers should not be considered unless you are going to soundproof your space. It's also not a good idea to try to use more than one condenser mic in the same room to record a podcast. Condensers are designed to pick up virtually everything. That means there will be audio bleed from one mic to another. Bleed is when the other person's audio ends up in your microphone's recording. I will touch more on the implications of this later. Condensers also need a power source. This isn't a separate power supply or anything like that. Uh, the power source is called phantom power. Phantom power delivers 48 volts through the mic cable to the microphone. A mixer, an interface, or even a computer in the case of some USB mics will provide this power. Since we're talking about condensers, let's talk about various kinds of sound treatment. Sound waves like smooth, flat surfaces to bounce off of, and depending on the sensitivity of your microphone, you will probably need some kind of sound treatment. This is a soundproof room. If you're going to be using a condenser mic, then this is the ideal environment. I've done professional voiceover in a room like this with a very nice, very expensive condenser mic. I definitely don't have the budget to do something like this for myself, but if you do, then more power to you. 
Uh, remember how we talked about bleed? It's for that reason that you can only record one person at a time in a room like this with a microphone like this. So this is an incredible example of sound diffusion. This is Blackbird Studio in Nashville, and this is obviously a professional studio. Sound diffusion is a series of uneven surfaces that break up sound waves. A DIY version of this is what I have behind me. I'm sitting in front of my bookshelf at home and it has various depths of books and openings. Any sound that would have bounced off the wall behind me and directly into the business end of my microphone is being deflected in different directions. Sound dampening can range from moving blankets hung on the wall to something like this. This is a picture of my former podcast studio in Buffalo, New York. See that cool black and white picture? It's actually sound dampening fabric that I had printed with drone photography of the city skyline. I had this made at a local print shop using special sound dampening fabric. This fabric's actually pretty readily available, so if you're interested in something like this, just contact your local print shops. Uh, the studio is a small space, essentially an office. It had acoustical drop panels for the ceiling, carpet, and thin walls. Uh, we regularly had three to five people in the studio at a time. We generally spoke across the table from one another and the sound could start to bounce around the room and into the microphone. So I came up with the solution. Any sound dampening or diffusion you can add behind the business end of the microphone will ultimately help your audio sound good. And oh, and by the way, don't do this. Anyone who tells you to put a blanket over your head to record, record an hour long podcast is not your friend. This is ridiculous. If you need this to make your microphone sound good, you have purchased the wrong type of microphone for your application. This guy is most likely trying to use a condenser microphone in a less than ideal space. So speaking of the business end of the microphone, let's talk element placement. Microphone element placement plays a critical role when talking about your polar patterns. You can't know where your polar pattern is or how it behaves if you don't know where your microphone element is. There are two types of element placement, in-fire or site address. An in-fire element captures audio from the end of the microphone. People always ask me what kind of microphone I use. This is the PR30 and this is what I'm using today. A side, element capture, a side address element captures audio from the side of the microphone. So now that you know about element placement, we can talk about polar patterns. Every microphone has a polar pattern. This is a polar pattern chart that you might find on a manufacturer's website. So what is this? The polar pattern determines how a microphone will pick up audio. This matters because depending on how you intend to use the microphone, the polar pattern can help or hurt your audio. The polar pattern is the area around the microphone element that will capture audio. Note that at the top, there's a zero. This zero represents talking straight into the mic element or what we call on axis. And 180 degrees at the bottom represents the very back of the microphone. You will hear people talk about the rejection of a microphone at 100 degree, 180 degrees off axis. This is what that is referring to. Anytime you get further away from zero, you are further off axis. We'll talk more about rear rejection later. So now you can see why it's important that you know where the microphone element is housed inside the body of the microphone. Let's look at an example. So this is the PR40. The PR40 is an end fire element. If we could see through the PR40, it would look like this. And we could see that the element is way up close to the end windscreen. To understand polar pattern diagrams, you have to start at the end of the microphone element. This is the polar pattern that we saw before, and this is the polar pattern of the PR40. This particular microphone has a cardioid polar, polar pattern. That means it picks up audio out of the end of the microphone element and slightly off axis, but it does not pick up sound out of the sides or the back of the microphone. There are different types of polar patterns, and the types of polar patterns dictate their application. First up is the cardioid that we just talked about. These are really ideal for podcasters. They are very directional and exhibit great rear rejection, so you don't have to soundproof a room to use them. I'll talk more about rear rejection in a moment. The supercardioid is going to have the same application suggestions as a cardioid. It is actually more directional and picks up less audio from the sides, but you do have to be aware that it can pick up some audio out of the back of the microphone. The microphone I'm using today is a supercardioid. Omnidirectional polar patterns pick up audio all around the microphone very evenly. You typically see these for like in the field journalism, like that man on the street interview. 
Uh, they're ideal for this application because they can be pointed at an audio source without much attention being paid to exact mic placement. These are not great if you'll be recording at a desk. They will pick up every paper shuffle or keyboard click. If you are using a lapel mic, it is most likely an omnidirectional mic. If you have ever used one of these mics, you will also know that it is not good for recording more than one person in a podcast because you are just going to end up with a lot of noise in the mix. Bi-directional polar patterns can be used to record more than one audio source at once, but they are very, very directional. Um, so you have to carefully place the microphone and don't move it. I know what I just said sounds very tempting if you're doing a podcast with a guest or a co-host. Uh, the problem with using a bi-directional mic to record two podcasters is that you have a you only have a single audio track. You can't edit volume levels or remove noise from the non-speaking podcaster. You really need one microphone per person being recorded and you need to record each of those people in their own audio track. That way when your co-host sneezes into their microphone while you are saying the most brilliant thing you've ever said, you can just cut them out. So now that you understand how the microphone picks up audio, let's talk about what it doesn't pick up. By the way, this concept really only applies to dynamic microphones. Rear noise rejection, reality. So you saw my old podcast studio a few slides back, but this is my reality now. The reason I recommend dynamic cardioid and super cardioid microphones to most podcasters is because of their rear noise rejection. Rear noise rejection refers to a microphone's ability to reject other audio signals outside of its polar pattern. Most of us don't have the resources to have a soundproof studio. The reality is most of you are like me and recording at home. We have pets, we have kids, we have roommates, I have neighbors. No matter what environment you are in, rear noise re rejection will keep your mic from picking up your co-hosts, keyboards, or paper shuffling. I also once recorded a podcast live on the trade show floor of the NAMM show. Uh, that's the largest trade show in the music industry and it has over 100,000 attendee attendees. It is so loud in there and the podcast sounded great. The reason I'm able to record in these unforgiving environments is because I use dynamic microphones that exhibit great rear rejection. This would not be possible with a condenser. Think back to the slide with the guy with the rug over his head. Um, yeah, we didn't put a rug over our head at the trade show. So rear rejection has saved my audio more times than I can count. Now that you understand where a microphone picks up audio and where it doesn't pick up audio, let's talk about how that audio sounds and the frequency response of a microphone. This is a frequency response chart. Frequency response is the range of sound that a microphone can reproduce. Each microphone has its own unique frequency response, and it is that frequency response that affects how the microphone will sound on any given person. People sometimes make a bigger deal out of this than what it really is. Uh, what you really need to pay attention to in a frequency response is the two to five kilohertz range between the red bars. This is roughly where the human voice is most articulate, and you wanna see a rise in the response in this area. This will mean that the microphone will have an articulate natural sound on the human voice. If you don't like how your voice sounds on your microphone, that's where some thoughtful equalization can help. Using equalization controls on an outboard mixer or in your digital audio workspace can adjust the EQ of your microphone. If you want your audio to be warmer, then increase the low frequencies. Conversely, if your audio is muddy, decrease your low frequencies. If you need more articulation in your sound, increase your mid-range frequencies, and if your audio sounds too nasally, decrease them. If you want more presence in your sound, increase the highs, and if that sound is too harsh, decrease the highs. Uh, these can also be used in combination to really dial in your sound. By the way, I am not using any EQ on my microphone. If you find the right microphone for your voice, you should not need EQ or extra processing. Okay, I can't get out of this section without talking about gain. Gain is a common issue that comes up with podcasters. Most interfaces, mixers, and some USB mics have a gain control on them. Many podcasters turn up the gain when what they really want is volume. I can't stress this enough. Gain is not volume. I'm going to say this again. Gain is not volume. As you can see on this mixer, gain, the red arrow, is different from the channel volume, the blue arrow, which is different from the master volume, the green arrow. Simply put, gain is the control of the microphone's input level. 
That is the strength of your mic's signal. Volume is the control of the microphone's output level or what podcasters want with perceived loudness. Increasing the volume too much simply makes your sound louder. However, increasing the gain too much at best makes your audio noisy and at worst can overdrive the mic, causing distortion, crackly sound, and high-pitched feedback. It's best to keep your gain levels around 50 to 60% as a starting point and adjust very slightly from there as needed. If you're using a mixer like the one pictured, you can then adjust your channel or master volume. If you're using an interface or USB mic, those tend to only have outboard gain controls and to change volume, you'll need to do it in your DAW or computer. Too often podcasters increase gain, not only for volume, but to compensate for improper mic technique because they are way too far off the mic. Um, I'll explain this in more detail later. So one of the most common questions that beginner podcasters are pondering is if they should use an XLR mic or a USB mic. A common thing I hear from podcasters is that they have a USB mic with no other information about it. As we've talked about, there are multiple types of mics and mic features. It's better to talk about mics as what kind they are first, for example, dynamic or condenser, because the output connection doesn't necessarily tell someone what a mic can or cannot do. However, the mic connection type is still important because of the very different applications. So there are two basic output connections for microphones for podcasting. First is the three pin XLR connector. This is the industry standard for professional microphones. They produce an analog signal that requires either an adapter, a mixer, or an interface to convert that analog signal to digital to be used with your computer. On the point of interfaces, most interfaces and USB mixers have a built-in preamp that should be sufficient to drive most well-designed mics without any additional preamp or processing. This issue typically applies only to dynamic mics since condensers are powered through phantom power, which I mentioned earlier. The second output connection is USB. These plug straight into your computer and they are already a digital signal. As a generalization, USB mics are more often condensers than dynamics and these are typically entry level or intermediate level products. So this last section is maybe the most important. Good mic technique will solve a lot of your problems. Unless your product manual specifically tells you not to talk directly into your mic, these tips are going to be universal. First, you wanna talk two finger widths away from the grill of your mic. I know that seems close, especially if you're new to using a microphone. I like to use a pop filter to teach people what that looks like and feels like. If you put your nose on the pop filter and don't take it off, uh, pop filters are a good tool if you tend to be a plosive speaker, meaning you poof out air when you say things like the letter P. I do that and I'm also a loud nose breather, which is why I'm using a windscreen on my microphone. So you also want to talk slightly off axis to the microphone. Don't move outside your polar pattern or the sound of the microphone will start to degrade. And the number one tip to your best microphone sound, monitor your audio. Monitoring your audio is some way that you can hear yourself when you are recording. Wear headphones. If you can get good studio quality headphones, if you can't at least wear earbuds, you can't know if you are too far off axis if you can't hear yourself. You won't know if your audio isn't good until after the fact and no post-production person wants to hear, you can fix that, right? Um, I've got two more tips that you will actually need to see me for me to best explain. Hi there. So the first one your grandmother is going to love. I want you to sit up straight. If you're doing something that's not too long, you could even stand up. This helps lengthen your diaphragm and regulate your breathing. The next thing I want you to do is stop projecting. You don't need to talk across the room just because your co-host is sitting over there. You only need to talk to your microphone. It's going to make your voice sound more pleasant and less harsh. The other thing you don't want to do is talk too softly. So if you saw that guy with the blanket over his head, um, he was probably talking like this too to compensate for using the wrong microphone. To recap, we've covered a lot of microphone concepts that you had probably heard before and hopefully now you understand. Many of these topics can go much deeper, but I hope this has at least given you the building blocks for great audio for your podcast. I like to tell people that a microphone is the tool for good audio and you have to have the right tool for the job. A screwdriver is a great tool, unless what you need is a hammer. So get the right kind of microphone and use it in the right way, and you won't ever have to worry about your audio again. 
Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope this talk has given you at least some of the tools that you need to get better audio for your podcast. Uh, we hope to see you soon. Thanks.